Amazon is much worse than a monopolist. It's not just a monopolist. It's not a market. Mm-hmm. It is not a capitalist. It is like, uh, think of it as a digital version of a fiefdom. Yeah, sure. In no. which vassal capitalists are laboring for the Lord, along with the peasants who may even love the Lord. So you mentioned before that, you know, th- th- these gadgets are all very convenient. I can't live my life without. Techno-feudalism, What Killed Capitalism, is the new book from the bestseller uh, Yanis Varoufakis, the hugely recognisable Greek economist who was his country's finance minister in 2015. Varoufakis thinks there is a new power reshaping the world and reshaping all of our lives. So what is techno-feudalism? Who is driving it? And is it bad for us and bad for democracy? Yanis Varoufakis, welcome to Times Radio. Thank you so much for having me, Hugo. Great pleasure to have you here. Look, this idea, the idea of techno-feudalism, the idea that we've sort of reverted to a feudal situation but with tech bosses as the new overlords, it's a fascinating idea. Tell us about it. It's based on this hunch that I developed some years ago that, um, uh, you know, I come from the left. We are the losers of history. We leftists, (laughs) as you very well know. We used to believe that organized labor would overthrow capital, capitalism, Mm -hmm. or take over capital. It never happened. But what has happened instead is a delicious irony. The capital became so triumphant that it mutated like a stupid virus that creates a variant that kills its host. Mm -hmm. So this is my hypothesis, that capital has become so successful and so powerful and so toxic that it has killed capitalism. Now, in practice, what does this mean and why should people care? It means that whereas uh, profit was the fuel and the lubricant of the socioeconomic system known as capitalism. And markets were the mechanism that uh, synthesized all our efforts, uh, brought together producers, consumers, uh, organized economic activity, uh, infected our culture, the whole thing. Now, we are moving away from profit back to rent, Mm-hmm. which is the feudal form of wealth accumulation. To, I mean, to, to, to give people a sort of very concrete idea of what you're talking about, mm-hmm. you're talking about, for example, the way, I don't know, on a really uh, basic level, the way we would have a Netflix subscription rather than buy DVDs, the way we rent our actually, music, the way we're less likely to own our homes. I mean, at what level do we do all this? Actually, allow me to put it slightly differently. Sure. Right. Once upon a time, Sachi and Sachi, the great advertisers, would create a poster or a TV ad. They would put the idea in your head that you wanted to buy something. Then you went out to a shop and you bought it from mm-hmm. the actual uh, shop that gets it from the producer directly. And the producer, the capitalist, would make a profit out of it. And profit would run the system. Today, Alexa is sitting on your desk or Siri or whatever, at some interface with uh, the net. Mm-hmm. Uh, you are training it to train you, to train it, to impress <laughs> upon you how good it is at giving you advice on what to buy. I don't know about you, but Spotify really mm-hmm. was, is spot on regarding you know, what I actually like. Yeah. And once it gets this power over you on the basis that it serves you and it gives you good advice, then it can recommend things for you to buy. And not only that, but this is the astonishing thing. You don't need to go to the shop to buy it. Mm-hmm. The same piece of what I call cloud capital, that capital that lives in the, on the cloud, sells you the stuff directly through Amazon.com, which is the same um, agglomeration of, of capital, cloud capital, as the Alexa that talks to you and interacts with you. That's not the market mm-hmm. anymore. It's not capitalism. What happens is Amazon charges 40%, 40% to the capitalist who produces the stuff that you buy. Amazon doesn't produce anything. So it's not just that you do not own stuff and you rent it. It is that you have the complete bypassing of markets Mm -hmm. and the replacement of profit with a new form of cloud rent or rent, which I call cloud rent. Uh, And why does this matter? It matters because our society becomes increasingly unstable as a result. Why why, why does it become unstable? Because I mean, some people would say this is this is great. I get what I get what I want. I don't need to do so much work about it. I don't care whether my money is going to some to one company I don't know or another company I don't know. So it goes to Amazon. How's that my problem? Because rent is waste. Right. Unlike profit, when uh, a producer of bicycles, of binoculars, of cars, whatever, gets a profit, they have to invest a large part of it. Uh, in order to maintain competitiveness. Mm -hmm. So this goes back into the economy. Uh, If you are a rentier, you collect rent in your sleep. Jeff Bezos doesn't need to do anything. Uh, Capitalists work for him. And when he gets uh, this 40%, Mm -hmm. he just puts it away. He uses it to speculate in financial markets. It doesn't go back into investment into anything. But, I mean, but for the for the consumer, 
this sort of thing has feels like it has made life easier, of right? It's made life cheaper, it. but it's made life cheaper. I use it. I can't live without. But it's made life cheaper as well, of course. Uh, and so the the waste is uh, the waste is is feels intangible. It feels intangible, but it really does poison our lives because, Hugo, if you think about it, uh, when let's say a large chunk of national income mm-hmm. is withdrawn from the uh, circular flow of income and is stashed away in some financial circuit mm-hmm. and simply feeds this financial game and comes out of people people's wages. Let me give you a very striking example. General Motors, mm-hmm. Ford Motor Company, Siemens, Volkswagen, they pay all those co- co- corporations, old-style capitalist corporations, pay 85% of their revenues as wages, salaries and so on. Facebook, 1%. Yeah. Amazon, 1.5%. What happens to the rest? It's withdrawn. The result is that the people out there suffer permanent austerity, not necessarily, you know, George Osborne's austerity, but austerity in the sense that there isn't enough money going around. Mm -hmm. That's why we have what David Graeber so scientifically described as bullshit jobs, because Mm -hmm. there's no good investment in in jobs. This is why central banks, like the Bank of England, cannot stop printing money, even when when they're trying to, you know, quantitatively tighten, because there's not enough money going around. So the state has to keep producing money, feeding even inflation. So... If we feel today that um, there is a poly crisis, as Adam Duz has described it, that you know we have multiple crises, including the climate crisis, that, in my estimation, has to do with that with the fact that after two thousand and eight, governments tried to save the banks and by printing something like thirty to thirty five trillion dollars, right? Mm. <laughs> Remember Gordon Brown, April two thousand and nine, bringing together the G seven central banks. They started the printing presses. Now, that money was never invested in anything except cloud capital by the Bezos and big tech. Mm. And the other big tech uh, conglomerate revolution, of course, take, took place in China. Yeah. In my book, I try to explain the new Cold War between the US and China. I ignored issues of Taiwan and so on. That I think this is absolutely relevant. Uh, just a red herring. It's the clash of the two forms of cloud capital sure. that are taking over the world, the American and the Chinese. And we here in Europe and in Britain are becoming increasingly sad, irrelevant entities. Well that's I mean that's a, that's that's another cheery point that we'll come on to in just a moment. <laughs> but um as a look as a as a figure of the left, um does this make does this make you want capitalism back? I mean does this make you nostalgic for capitalism? Does this make you think we need to rescue capitalism? Because that's a very uh, counterintuitive position for you to find yourself in. I'm nostalgic about poetry, about uh, drama, about art. I'm never nostalgic about a dead socioeconomic system. So mm. if this was the 1770s, 1800s, would we be nostalgic of feudalism, which was dying? No. Let's move on. Mm. Uh, I ju- I'm just nostalgic of the idea of the liberal individual, and that I'm saying as a leftist. Yeah. Because the idea of, you know, of a uh, nice ring fencing between your work life and your leisure, that's all gone now. But so, so does this make what you're talking about, this techno feudalism, this move yes. from capitalism towards towards the situation that you've, you've mm. very eloquently described, does that make it harder? Does that you're basically saying that makes it much harder, if not impossible, to then move towards socialism, social democracy in the manner that you would have always wanted to do. That's that's become a harder task now. You are right in a, in an important sense. Social democracy is bank. It's finished. Right. Um, I say this without any glee. I'm not a social, social, social democrat, but I do believe that social democracy played a very important civilizing role in the 1960s and 70s. So, you know, Harold Wilson in this country, Willy Brandt in Germany, Bruno Kreisky in Austria. What they did was they played the role of referee. They uh, brought into one large room uh, the captains of industry, mm. uh, leaders of the auto industry of st- steel making and so on on one side, and the TUC the organized labor on the other, and they cut a deal between them, uh, whereby a chunk of the surpluses of the capitalists would fund the state, NHS, yeah, and so sure. on, and but wages. You, and you know, That cannot happen now. But you'd think that would be easier to do that, now, because you're... No, only, you're that, only, now you're, it is absolutely, utterly but, impossible. But you'd think, like, the... I mean, it's, it's for, us, for us, us relatively small, small countries in Europe, it's hard. In the United States, you'd think they could more easily 
cut a deal, the government could cut a deal with Amazon to reincorporate some of the money. No, is that not, I mean... Well, look at what's happening in the United States today. Uh, Lima Khan, Khan mm. who is the chair of the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, is starting, I think she's very well-meaning and she's a very smart woman, and I wish her very well. She's starting a law, um, a, a legal battle against mm -hmm. Amazon. Yeah. But I think she's uh, doing it the wrong way. Right. Because she's treating... Amazon in the way that Teddy Roosevelt mm -hmm. treated Standard Oil and Rockefeller back in the 1920s Absolutely. as a monopolist that needs to be broken up. Amazon is much worse than a monopolist. It's not just a monopolist. It's not a market. Mm -hmm. It is not a capitalist. It is like, uh, think of it as a digital version of a fiefdom. Yeah, sure. In no. which vassal capitalists are laboring for the Lord along with the peasants who may even love the Lord. So you mentioned before that, you know, th th these gadgets are all very convenient. I can't live my life without them. Yeah, sure. So we are voluntary servants, voluntary yeah. cloud serfs to these people. So, and you know, Lima Khan has her work cut out for her. That's, yeah, that sort of makes sense and huge. Look, for a quick recap, you were you yes. were the, the Greek finance minister for, for eight months in... in no, five and a half. Five, forgive, forgive me, five and a half, five and a half. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible exaggeration. Um, just felt like longer. In, in 2015, uh, having just been elected to parliament with your, com your, your country yeah. in deep recession and your party was promising to renegotiate Greece's debt and curtail its austerity measures mm -hmm. and ultimately you, res you resigned from your position and then from parliament having not been able to, to achieve what you'd, what you'd set out to yes. do. Yes. Um, Hopefully that's a, that's a very quick summary of a big it's, time, and it's hopefully it's reasonable. Um, it's perfectly reasonable. Does the kind of do the kind of developments you're talking about in this book make you think differently about that time? No, not at all, because that no. was a very brutish and antiquated kind of clash. Right. Um, Greece for twenty years after we joined or we started the process of joining the eurozone, uh, we became uh, um, the typical, the archetypal case of vendor financing. Mm -hmm. So, to put it in crude but not misleading terms, you know, Mercedes-Benz or Volkswagen were giving us the money to buy their cars. Uh, <laughs> that's mm -hmm. vendor financing. Yeah. Um, it was their way of getting rid of surplus products and surplus money, and it was the way of the Greek bourgeoisie, ruling state, ruling class state, to pretend that we were growing. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, this was never going to end well. Uh, the moment uh, Lehman Brothers went under, Deutsche Bank went under, the financing stopped and you know, the bubble burst and then we were bankrupt. Mm -hmm. And then the European Union in its, in its infinite wisdom and our ruling class in its uh, cruelty decided to cover up the bankruptcy by taking on more loans to pretend that we could repay our previous loans, which we couldn't, on conditions of austerity, of harsh austerity, I mean, unbelievable austerity, which was depleting the incomes, the little incomes that couldn't repay the previous mm -hmm. loans. And I stepped in there for one purpose, to cut this process dead, mm -hmm. to stop this, to say we need to embrace our bankruptcy, we need to suffer the consequences of our bankruptcy, uh, but no more loans, no more credit cards, pretending we are repaying the previous credit mm -hmm. cards. And that is the only way of rebooting and restarting. And you don't need to be a left-winger to believe that. That's why I had a lot of support amongst the Tories in this country. How, how, how does it look <laughs> yeah. Um, how, how do you look back on your, that period? Do you look back on that period as um, as you did the best you could do? Do you look back that you that you succeeded in some way or that you, or in, or that you entirely failed? I entirely failed. Entirely failed, yeah. But I don't regret it for a moment. I, I have to say that I... I have a certain amount of pride in the sense that I went in there to do the right thing. I was prevented from doing the right thing by my own prime minister, mm -hmm. especially on the night of the 5th of July 2015 when the Greek people very heroically uh, gave us a 62% referendum mandate to do the right thing. The prime minister succumbed, surrendered, and I resigned. And I think that there's something to be said about politicians who resign when they realize that they cannot do what they promised their <laughs> electorate they they'd, should do. Well, generally, they'd have to resign an awful lot if that was, if that was the norm, <laughs> wouldn't it? I Look, agree. <laughs> your, your, old, your old party, Syriza, has just elected as leader Stefanos uh, Kasselikas, yes. who has no sort of real political career to date at all and no parliamentary seat and lived in Miami until earlier this year. And he's now the, the leader of the Greek opposition. Um, where does this leave sort of the left in Greece when you, you need a figure like this to come in and, and lead? In desperation. Right. There's no left left. There's no left left, really. <laughs> I mean, uh, we have 
uh, I have started the party uh, some time ago. We managed to get elected to parliament. We got nine seats in 2019. We lost our seats last June, and instead there are three fascist parties sitting where we used to sit. Uh, I, m the, the gentleman that you mentioned, uh, I'm sure he's a very, very nice person, uh, and I don't mind the fact that he lived in Miami. I used to live in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> Who am I to judge him on that? But I don't know him. Nobody mm -hmm. had heard of him until... It, it, this was the nearest you can get to a hostile takeover of a political party within mm -hmm. three weeks by an unknown um, suitor. Yeah. Um, but look, the night of that, that referendum that I mentioned before when uh, my colleague and prime minister effectively betrayed the mandate of the people was the end of that party mm -hmm. and of the left of that party had managed to encourage, to reinforce and so on. Now what we have is a logical conclusion of that depoliticization of the left. Right. Understood. Look, Yanis Varoufakis, I'm afraid we've got to leave it there. But thanks very much. A great pleasure to speak to you. Techno feudalism, who killed capitalism, is, I believe, it's out now. It's out already? Yes, it was out two days ago. Out two days ago. Wonderful. Yanis Varoufakis, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.